This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. My name is Dean Nielsen and I am a mathematics teacher at Murrieta Valley High School. I would like to say how pleased I am to have this opportunity to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Dan Schlink. A big part of the reason I'm here is to let you know how Dan initially became interested in science, particularly toxicology, but first a little bit about me. Though I am a math teacher, don't start thinking that I'm not a lover of all things science. I have a microbiology degree with a chemistry minor. I've taught physical science, biology, chemi chemistry, honors chem, la da 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 da. Of course, I teach math today. But if anyone were to ask me, I would tell them that science is my favorite topic. I was introduced to science by my high school biology teacher and originally wanted to be a health inspector, then a water scientist, whatever that is and finally spent my early years at, uh, in the labs at Unocal Research Center in Brea. This experience has allowed me to see the wide application of the work Dan is performing. After having seen the research Dan is uh, working on, I admire the fields that he accesses on a daily basis. He examines aquatic animals to see the effects of our residual chemicals at the ecological system, organ, and biomolecular levels. He also uses math to determine the sample size needed for the research and to quantify the results obtained. At which point Dan is likely to publish his conclusions in any number of professional journals. Truly Dan is a multi-dimensional player in today's scientific community. Dan grew up in Torrance, California, loved to surf, scuba, snorkel, anything that had to do with salt water. Upon high school graduation, Dan selected Northeast Louisiana University near Monroe to begin his studies as a pre-med student. When a professor named Paul Ferguson, the same Paul Ferguson that is the president at University of Maine now, talked him out of med school telling him to follow his heart and study marine science and toxicology. The rest, as they say, is history. Dan then went to the Oregon State University to see how marine animals handle toxic chemicals where he received his PhD in aquatic toxicology. Then off to Duke for some post-grad studies, stints at the University of Arkansas, Ole Miss, and finally back to Southern California here at UCR. Dan's current research takes him across the world, Australia, Great Britain, China, Italy, South Africa, even the Salton Sea. I have been to around 10 of these science lecture series over the last few years and feel that to me each one is more interesting than the previous. With that in thought, with that thought in mind, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Dan Schlink. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Well, good evening. Um, it's nice to see you all here to this evening. Um, when I was asked to do this talk, it was uh, a bit daunting because when you think about water, it's, it's a massive, uh, molecule, a massive uh, issue related to not only the state of California, but also the world. So what we'll do uh, in this particular talk is actually hit on some issues related to its global significance, its significance in California, and also what you guys can do to sort of make things better. So we have a fairly complex issue before us. So when I see complexity, I tend to go the other direction. I like to start off sim with simplicity. And water itself is actually a very simplistic molecule. It's amazing when you think about it. When you think about all of the cellular functions that take place within you and within animals and plants, it's basically two functions that take place. And it's the movement of electrons to molecules and the movement of electrons away from molecules. And water actually serves that purpose in and of itself. The protons on water, the hydrogen atoms, provide electrons. And oxygen actually 
sucks electrons. So without those two capacity, without those two functions, we wouldn't have life on this planet. Now there are other molecules that do similar things. In fact, if you know anything about the deep sea vents in the in the ocean, they actually use H2S, which is a very similar molecule to water. The difference being, though, is that water can actually be stored in a different physical form. Okay? We see that every winter up on the mountains, right? That's it's snow and ice. We see it in the polar regions. Um, because of that storage capacity, it allows us to use water even when it's not being created. And that's very important, particularly for the state of California. So, simple molecule, but amazing ramifications of that simplicity, particularly in terms of its storage and fate. So what is its fate? Well, water, believe it or not, is continuously recycled, okay? And because of these states being able to exist in steam, basically water vapor, it actually exists in the air, obviously as a solid, as ice and snow, it's on the mountains, and it's in a liquid form, which runs through rivers and streams, but also in the ground, which is another form of storage for this particular entity. So very complex system, but it moves from one form to the other. And it's really important, if you, have, if you don't remember anything about today's talk, remember that water is naturally recycled and naturally reused. Okay. Now, another interesting aspect of water is not a lot of it is useful for us, or animals in general, believe it or not. Um, most of it is actually salt water. And the only use you can have for that is unless you go surfing or do fun stuff like that for recreation. But in terms of consumption, very, very little is actually used for human consumption. Most of it is actually, again, 97.5% of it is actually in a form that we can't consume, at least as is. And most of that, 2.5% that's left over, again, occurs in glaciers and permanent snow cover. So again, it's in a solid storage form. About 30% we actually have in groundwater, that again is another storage form, and less than 0.3% of that 2.5% is actually available for drinking. It's pretty amazing when you think about how much water there is on this planet. And because of that, that limited resource, it's really, really important to maintain those sources of it. And what's happening throughout the world is that as population is growing, there's a, becoming a demand on water that's actually making it very, very difficult to meet those needs, particularly in uh, areas throughout the world, but mostly in areas that have the highest population densities and growths. In fact, more than a billion people lack access to clean drinking water. Two and a half billion people do not have adequate sanitation services. If you had clean water, you would actually prevent 10 to 20,000 child deaths every day. Okay? Um, we're pumping ground out of, uh, water out of the ground faster than we can replace it. And this has actually led to serious international complications and eventually maybe even armed conflict. So it's a, it's a very, very serious issue around the globe. And this is basically some of the more water-stressed regions throughout the world, particularly in Africa. Asia per, right now is actually moving in that direction. By the end of the century, China, unless they actually are able to complete their own aqueduct, will actually run out of water. Beijing will actually run out of water. So um, again, less than 0.1% of water that's available is actually available for drinking. So very, very low numbers out there. So what's this got to do with California? Well, California has some very interesting water issues in and of itself, and very interesting imbalances. So we've talked a little bit about the population imbalance around the world. Let's talk about the population imbalances of California. Okay, Most of our water in the state is actually formed, including Southern California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. It actually is, again, snow that's up on the Sierras. And if you ever are up skiing on Snow Valley or you know, Squaw or anything like that, just realize that 
you're probably skiing on water that you're going to be drinking in a few years by the time it gets down here. So just remember that next time you're, you know, have to do a little uh, job when you're out on the, on the slope a little bit, you know, that water is coming down someplace. So just be thinking about that. So, um, but there's a great video, if you guys are interested, UC Davis has put together called Sierra to the Sea. And that's essentially where the water goes. It starts in the Sierras, goes to the ocean. And we try to snag it at different places along the way. So essentially, all of the water is created pretty much in Northern California. But where is our population? Well, about 30 million people live in Southern California, roughly. So water's up here, people are down here. So that's one imbalance that we have. The other imbalance is that most of our water in California comes when? In the wintertime, right? That's when it snows and rains. But our highest demand and usage, particularly for agriculture, which is our number one use for water, is typically in the summer. So you have that imbalance as well. And a third imbalance is that of climate change, which is taking place rapidly. What does that mean? That means we're getting less and less snowpack for storage of water. Now, it's interesting. We're getting the same amount of water. But again, it's that physical property of water that makes it unique in terms of being able to be stored. So we get rainstorms. They just seem to be more intense. And we're not able to store that water, as opposed to consistent snowstorms that actually allow us to store the water. So we've got flooding. We've got droughts that tend to spike and, and, and are increasing throughout the last 100 years or so. so how do we deal with imbalances? Well, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans did. Romans lived in a Mediterranean climate. And how did they move water around? They actually built these amazing structures that we can still see today that transported millions and millions of gallons of water from a source to usually a population center. Okay, And we did the same thing in the early part of the 20th century. In fact, if, if you guys were a little bit older, anybody ever seen the movie Chinatown? Yeah? So one of the best lines, I, I, I usually open up this talk with, a, with a, a clip from that. But at the end of the movie, Mr. Uh, Gitz, who's the PI that's trying to solve this murder, comes in contact with this guy that actually bought up millions of acres of land in the San Fernando Valley, which at the time in the 1930s was a desert. And so what happened was, uh, they started moving water into the desert, and they were going to do this, although nobody knew that this was going to happen, except for this guy. And so his, the, famous, the best line in this whole movie is, well, Mr. Gitz, you either bring Los Angeles to the water or the water to Los Angeles. And hence, we started the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which essentially drained the Owens Valley. If you've ever been up on the eastern side of the Sierras and seen that big dry white patch out there, that used to be a huge lake. And all of that water has now come down to Southern California, particularly Los Angeles. But it, you also might note that it's dry now. There's not a lot of water there. It's still coming down from the Sierras. But most of our water now is actually delivered through a different aqueduct, which is uh, the California Aqueduct, which runs from the San Joaquin and Sacramento River Delta all the way through the Central Valley, has to go over the Grapevine Mountains, 650 meters, right? You guys have seen the Grapevine, right? Magic Mountain. So you got to lift that water up over those mountains and then bring it back down into Southern California. So tremendous amount of energy required, which we'll get to in a minute, and a tremendous amount of distance required. But the point is, is most of this water originates from this delta region. Now, why is that significant? Well, again, 80% of Southern California's water is now coming from that, that area. But some things have happened recently. For one, when you take water away from areas, the ground tends to sink. That's called subsistence. And what happens is when that ground sinks, you have to build levees to keep so ocean water, in this particular case, San Francisco Bay, from intruding into those lands. So we have these series of levees, which you can actually see here on the right, a photo of one that's actually just been breached through a, a severe storm that actually came through. If any of you guys remember Katrina, levees are really important, right? 
you breach the levee, you have serious damage to cities. So levees are critical, and these have not been altered or changed or, or uh, strengthened in many, many, many decades. So that's one weakness. The other thing is, as I mentioned, demand's going up, snowpack's going down, right? We got more and more people coming to Southern California, less and less water that's stored for us. The other thing is this delta area is very significant because it actually is very diverse from the biological side, which is what I actually do my research on and have become more familiar with. And this is in critical danger, particularly from endangered species. So here's just a little figure. You can see this, this graph showing uh, basically in delta agricultural use, which is the blue on the bottom. You can see that since about 1950s, that the Central Valley Project, which is basically that California aqueduct that's bringing water from that region down through the Central Valley, which is where we get all of our, our produce from, right, all the way to Los Angeles and Southern California, that demand has been increasing dramatically, as has water just for general human consumption. So ag uh, input has increased, or ag demand has increased, as has citizen use has also increased. And what this is doing, it's very interesting. So down below on the right is actually a picture of the tributary system of the delta. So what happens when you suck fresh water away? As I mentioned, salt water comes in to replace it. And a lot of these systems, biologically and ecologically, are not made for salt water. So what, what do you think you get? You start getting exotic species and exotic species, plus you're getting development, and water removal changes the, the ecology of the system dramatically. So just, to, just some key numbers on what the delta is like and why it's so important. Okay, there's 57 different islands in this area, 750 species of wildlife. You've got 1,100 miles of levees, okay? These are those walls that are trying to keep salt water out. And the, the key is, this delta is made from freshwater flow. It's 10,000 years old. So over the last 100 years, we've been trying to change the hydrobiology and the hydrology of a system that's taken 10,000 years to make. And we're trying to engineer that so that we can actually get as much water out of that, but still maintain some form of biological diversity. Very, very difficult. And again, most of this water is going for ag, and a lot of it's going down here for, for people. The losers in this, as you might imagine, are the animals for which water is very, very important, and that would be fish. This is my little starred Public Policy Institute disclaimer slide, so note the little asterisk there. What you can see is that in 1980, from 1989 to about 2010, we've basically reduced in half the number of species that are stable in that system. Uh, and we've essentially doubled those that have been listed as endangered species, okay? So diversity going down, bad, bad news, right? Well, it's very bad for at least four different species, and we'll see that it's not just these four. But one little species, this little guy on the far left-hand corner here, is called the delta smelt. Anybody heard of the delta smelt? Yeah, delta smelt, little fish about this big, right? And it, since 2000, you can kind of see that that 2000 peak as being the inflection point, has dramatically been diminished in population. And because it's been listed as an endangered species, some dramatic things have been happening. And well, one question is, why has it been diminishing in, in, in population? Well, again, going back to water usage, if you, fo if you follow this black line here, okay, water demand has been going up. And when did it start really jumping? Right about 2000, okay? And why was that? Well, for one, the Colorado River demand was actually going down, and that's because we weren't allowed to use Colorado River water, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But that just enhanced the greater stress on the delta. So we pull more water out, started about 2000. The population crashes of these pelagic organisms started crashing about the same time. So what does this mean? This means Endangered Species Act litigation comes forward, and a federal judge basically said, 
turn the tap off. No more water going to the Central Valley, no more water going to Southern California. We are gonna maintain this species and we're shutting the water off. And in fact, if you go back up, you can actually see how this peak occurs right about 2007. That's when this judge made that d distinction. And as the water was shut off, you can actually see demand going back down, okay? So, a lot of people very controversial about this. Is it people or is it a fish? Is it people or is it a fish? Who do we supply in this? Very difficult situation. Well, one of the reasons why the Endangered Species Act was invoked in the first place, particularly with little fish like this that you would think don't matter so much, the problem is, is that the systems are all interrelated. And if we start looking at fish that do matter, particularly economically, now we start bringing money into the scene, right, things get a little more, oh, okay, now I see. In fact, this particular process, anybody heard of the canary in the gold mine or coal mine system? Yeah, so you don't get mad at the canary, right? You don't say, is it canary or is it us, right? You don't go back in the coal mine. That's the, that's the whole point, right, until the air is clear. So again, I, I highly encourage you is to look at this in a holistic system. All the Delta smelt is telling us is that things are bad. And it's already been linked to other species of fish that have no real uh, interaction with Delta smelt per se. But the same thing is happening, okay? So that is the Delta. Now, fortunately for us here in Riverside, not so much you guys in Temecula, which we'll talk about here in a minute, but in the city of Riverside, believe it or not, 100% of our drinking water comes from those mountains right outside the San Bernardino and San Gabriel Mountains, fortunately for us. And that water, again, stored as snow, then percolates down into groundwater. So if you live in the city limits, city limits of Riverside, 100% of your drinking water comes from groundwater, which again, eventually comes from the, uh, the snow melt. Now, if you happen to live north of the city of Riverside, say in the Rubido, uh, Rancho Cucamonga area, 67% of your water actually comes from the Bay Delta. Okay, it's transported. It's part of that aqueduct system that it is transported down into that. A Little bit is groundwater, but most of it again is water that's transported massive miles away from where the people are actually drinking it. But if you live south of Riverside, we have another source of water. And this is the Colorado River. So those of you who live in Temecula and Marietta and all those, your surrounding areas, 85% of your water comes from the Colorado River. Now, that's a problem. Why is that a problem? Well, because people are leaving California and guess where they're moving? They're going upstream. It, you know, the Native Americans figured this out. Well, if the water's going dry, what do you do? You walk upstream. So where are people moving to? Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, right? And because they're siphoning that water off and you have multiple states involved, and that's the other political issue here. In California, we can pretty much do whatever we want, right? If we can have enough money, we can move water from, from the Delta down to the South because it's our own state water supply, right? Well, this, it's a little more complicated, right? It's not just California's water. It's all these other states, and these populations are increasing. Demand is increasing, as you can see by the blue line here. In fact, it's actually exceeded supply. What does that mean? It means the Colorado River is essentially dry by the time it hits the Sea of Cortez. So, and in fact, it's been such to an extent that water has basically been shut off recently in Imperial Valley and sent to San Diego, basically. It's changed tremendously how water usage is taking place, particularly in the southeastern part of Southern California. So those are the problems, right? So in life, you either can complain and be a pessimist, sort of the guy here on the, uh, on the left, or you can be an optimist, right? And try to find some sort of solutions to this. So let's talk about some of the solutions. Solutions that we can do as, as a people and solutions that you can do as an individual. So four different sort of possibilities here. Groundwater recharge, municipal water reuse, desal, 
and conservation. So anybody ever watched the OC? No? Historically? I mean, I know it's not been on for a while. Come on. I know some of you guys have watched the OC. Yes? So what do we think of when we think of the OC? Why do they call it the OC? It's, it's a pretty ritzy area, right? You always think of, you know, housewives of Orange County and, you know, everybody's driving a Beamer and, you know, has the yacht and, you know, travels to Cabo every weekend and does all the shopping and all this kind of stuff, right? It's kind of this amazing place. Well, believe it or not, they are actually leading the world in terms of groundwater recharge. And guess where their water comes from? Well, this is a nice, this is an aerial shot of the Prado wetland. Okay, now you guys, I don't know how many times you travel on the 91 freeway, but if you're traveling down the 91, moving from Riverside to say Orange County, you actually are going right along the Santa Ana River. And right before you get to the Orange County line, there's this big dam. And it has Spirit of 76 written across it. And there's all these trees and stuff back behind it. Well, that's a wetland, and it's actually been constructed for a purpose. The reason being is, all of that water that comes into that wetland is actually coming from us. And it's coming from us through our toilet. There are at least 12 different wastewater treatment sites on the Santa Ana River that discharge in the Santa Ana River so that during the summer, particularly during the spring, summer, non-rainy season, 100% of that water flow is wastewater dominated. So what does that mean? Well, there's some issues related to wastewater, which we'll talk about here in a minute. One of them is nitrogen. You don't, we don't want nitrates in our, in our water. So the Prado wetland was actually built to actually remove nitrogen from wastewater that's derived from riverside toilets. Okay? That water then is actually percolated down through this big dam, and is, there's a shutoff valve that that water is then engineered to come out through the Santa Ana River. And what's really interesting is they will actually periodically shut off flow to the Santa Ana River and they'll go in with tractors and scrape off the layers of the bottom of the river and create a meandering stream so that the water slowly moves through that river so that it percolates into groundwater. And guess whose groundwater that is? The OCs. So they are basically 75, up to 75% in low flow months of their drinking water is our toilet water. A little bit of a paradox, right? You got the Beamer, you got the toilet water, right? Kind of interesting. Now they've been drinking Riverside water for a long time, but they've also, believe it or not, and many people, I don't know, if you have any friends in OC, you can, you can ask them, they've been drinking their own sewage themselves actually for quite some time. In fact, the groundwater replenishment system is one of the leading systems, as I mentioned, in the world today in terms of groundwater replenishment. They've been doing this for a year. In fact, you can go to this website, and this number that's up there on the top, it's actually a few weeks old because I, I printed it out to make the slide. That number keeps moving, and you can actually see the numbers of gallons that are actually being created every day, and they're up to at least 70 million gallons per day of water that's actually being reclaimed. Okay? Now, that's their own se secondary wastewater sewage that they're filtering through this process called reverse osmosis. And then what they do is they then inject that into the ground. And again, they've been doing this for years because they sit on the ocean. If you suck out water, just like in the delta, salt water comes in. So they have to replenish that fresh water to keep the salt water from coming in. Now, little did they know that this was also being part of their drinking water. So they said, heck, since we've been doing this for so long, let's do it for drinking water replenishment as well. So they started reusing, using more and more sophisticated filtr filtration to actually make the water a little bit cleaner and doing this groundwater replenishment reuse combined project. Reuse, believe it or not, is not done a whole lot. Um, worldwide. Basically, again, only about 5%, and particularly in the United States, only about 5 to 6% of the United States, or North America, I should say, uses or reuses their water. That's a, a smidgen of the amount of water that, that's out there. If you look at Israel, 70% of their water is, is reused. Singapore used to be 15. In fact, Singapore is 
they patterned their reuse system after Orange Counties. And they will be at 30% here very, very soon. And uh, I'm sorry, they already are at 30%. It's Australia that now is actually moving up to 30%. Australia is only about 8% right now. But if you've read anything about the Murray River system and, again, their drought issues related to climate change, they're in serious trouble. So they're going to go to reuse as well by, by 2015. And because of Orange County and other locations, California, believe it or not, is the leading water reuse state in the country. But what's interesting about that is most of that water, it's not used for human consumption. It's actually used for ag. And it's used for landscape. And you, you guys have seen this, right? Golf courses, don't drink the water, not potable. This is gray water, don't drink it, blah, blah, blah. So it's used very widely, OK? Um, very, very little use for drinking water. Well, why is that? Well, there's this thing that's called the yuck factor, OK? When you think about drinking water, and right, this was my whole sort of spiel about Orange County and everything, you don't associate water with sewage, right? Most people don't really want to drink their own urine, OK? Astronauts do it, but, you know, they're astronauts. It's not just you and I living in our house, right? Our half or $1.5 million house, which these guys in Orange County are doing, right? So how do we deal with this? And what are the issues? Well, a lot of the issues related to this have always been sort of taste and maybe even biological, maybe getting you know, viruses or bacteria. But more recently, one of the biggest concerns has been that of what are called emerging contaminants. So let's think about this a little bit. If Orange County's water is coming from riverside toilets and showers, what does that mean? That means everything you consume, particularly drugs or soaps or fragrances or anything that you shower off in the morning or in the evening, shampoos, sunscreens, all of that winds up going where? Into the wastewater. And where does that wastewater go? into surface water. And in Southern California, that goes into drinking water. So there's always been this big concern of, well, can we drink this water? And is it safe in terms of all of these emerging contaminants that are basically present? And of course, you know, there's drinking water, and there's also the wildlife. What about the fish? I mean, we only drink the water. Fish live in it 24-7, right? They're continuously exposed. So are these compounds actually accumulating in fish such that, you know, if we eat the fish, are we going to get uh, uh, you know, exposure to drugs, or is it affecting the biology of the fish so that they're actually getting hammered? Well, let's just take a look at some of these. So this is uh, just an, a general list that's been put out by the USGS that shows some general compounds. Some of these you may know, some of these you may not know. Triclosan, for example, is in your toothpaste. That's one that actually goes down fairly regularly. But let's take one, um, let's take Prozac, which is fluoxetine, right there in the middle. So you can see the red bar. Basically, you are the influent into a sewage wastewater treatment plant is roughly about 100 nanograms per liter. That's what comes in in surface water. What goes out, or what we see in surface water, in treated water or in groundwater, is roughly on average about 8 nanograms per liter. Now, 8 nanograms per liter. Let's think about that. That's what's called a part per trillion. Okay? That means one part in a trillion parts of something else, right? In fact, if we think of it in terms of a drop, one part per trillion is a, an eye drop full of water in 16 Olympic swimming pools. So guess how much water you would have to drink in order to get a therapeutic dose of Prozac? So this is where math comes into play. Right? Basically, you would have to drink about 7 million 12 ounce glasses of water in order to get a daily dose, which is about 20 milligrams. Okay? So, is there an issue related to that? Is it as simple as going to the tap and, you know, getting your drug hit for the day? Probably not. In fact, I study toxicology. And the premise of toxicology, and this is the take-home message you should all get, is that exposure does not equal toxicity. What does that mean? That means just because you read a newspaper article that tells you, oh my gosh, there are 25 pharmaceuticals in my water, what's the question you should be asking? 
How much? Right? It's how much. The, and in fact, this guy on the right here, his name's Paracelsus, he's what, he is the father of toxicology, he figured out about 500 years ago, is that all things are toxic. Salt's toxic, water is toxic. If you drink enough water, you will die. Okay? All things are toxic. It's the dose that determines the poison. And out of that, it's the risk that is associated with that dose. Okay? How do we determine risk? Essentially, it's very simple. You take the amount of the compound that's present and the threshold that is needed to cause an adverse effect. Very, very simple. Okay? And I guarantee you, rarely is that ever discussed in newspaper articles. Okay? They want to scare you. They don't want you to do the risk analysis and actually determine, well, how risky is that? Is that as risky as getting into a school bus and driving 10 miles an hour down up to 215? Okay? Trust me, it's not. Being any time on the 215 is taking your life in your own hands. So, so because of this, and because California actually wants to increase water reuse, they were pretty concerned about these drugs. So they actually assembled a task force, which I was a part of, that we actually did a risk assessment on thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of thousands of thousands of chemicals. And you know how many chemicals that we actually recommended that they be monitored? Four. And three of them are in you, naturally. One's a steroid hormone that's in every female, which is estradiol. The other one is a byproduct from, ni from nitrates that you actually get naturally produced in your, in your own uh, system. The other one, caffeine, I'm sure you definitely have a little bit of that every once in a while during the day. And the other one was triclosan, right? Which I'm sure you basically have right now if you brush your teeth this morning. Unless you don't brush your teeth, is that so? But again, the idea is use risk analysis to determine what priorities are. That's the take home message there. All right, so we've talked about groundwater re, re, uh, re reclamation. We've talked about water reuse. What about desalinization? We live next to the ocean. 97.5% of the water is salt water. Can't we use that? Well, it is being used around the world. The Middle East is just tremendous in terms of its use of, wa of, of water. Why can they do that? They have a lot of energy. The, the, the downside of desal throughout the years has always been it costs too much energy. We just don't have enough energy. Well, let's think about this for a minute. Let's do the math on this. Let's do some comparisons. For one, one thing that's been happening, and this figure up on the upper right has actually shown that the cost for actually conducting desalinization has actually been decreasing. Why is that? Primarily because of research and development. Okay. And these membranes that are basically being used to filter out water have gone through tremendous changes over the last five to 10 years. Particularly here at UCR, with nanomaterials, we've actually been able to make nanotube membranes that actually enhance filtration with less energy requirements. Right? And all of these are being implemented as we speak, not, and not just here, all around the world. So this has dramatically dropped the costs. But it's still, somewhat still costs money to force water through these membranes. So how do you do that? Well, and so let, well, let's do the math. Let's do the math on the energy. Believe it or not, think about this. We talked about these aqueducts, right? Water transport in the state of California uses 20% of the state's energy, 20% of the total energy for the state. And here's the crazy thing is, Energy production is one of the largest users of water. So think about this. You're using 20% to get the water, and then you're using that to make the energy to get the water to make the energy to get the water to get the energy, right? So what does that mean? That means you're using more and more and more water exponentially, right? So the energy costs of water movement, particularly in our state, are very high, right? And in fact, if we compare, let's just take a look at the Orange County Water District's groundwater replenishment system and how much energy is required. I'll pay more attention on the right because this is actually, the metric on the right is actually normalized per acre feet of water. So it's how much wa energy it takes to get water, essentially. And for Orange County 
the Orange County project, you are basically right at 1,000 kilowatt hours per acre foot. Compare that to the Colorado River aqueduct. That's not even the one that takes the water over the mountain, right? Look at the state water project. That's the one that takes it over the mountain, okay? So groundwater recharge, very nice. Now, let's, let's take a look at saltwater desal. Still the highest energy usage, but let's, let's kind of make this Southern California specific. What happens if you take that Colorado River aqueduct bar and put that on top of the state water project bar? Is desal still the most expensive option? It's not. Again, very regionally specific, particularly for California. And it is something, by the, by the end of the century, the city of San Diego's goal is to have zero water discharge through their outfall at Point Loma. Zero freshwater discharge. So it's coming. So these are things that big companies can do. What can I do? What can you do? What can you do in this room? Well, these are just some things that I came up on my own, just kind of brainstorming, asking people, and just kind of came up. There's a really cool website that I highly recommend you guys do is, is this thing that's called What's Your Water Footprint? Now, these series talks that we've had, we've talked about carbon footprints. So now we're going to talk about water footprints. I prefer the term water budget. I don't know what the deal is with, with feet, but it's just, you know, feet are everywhere. I, I, I don't understand. This is actually a shower in South Australia. As I mentioned, Australia has a real serious issue with water. In fact, they have a series of what are called water restrictions. So this is a photo out of National Geographic about South Australia. And one of the things that they do, and I thought this was pretty clever, is they collect all of their shower water. They actually take multiple person showers. Yay. OK. So this is kind of fun if you're with the right person, I guess. But um, <laughs> the deal is you, know, you collect the water. Now, you may not want to do this. I mean, and again, these are all recommendations. They're not things that I just thought they were kind of interesting. And in fact, what we've actually done, you can actually see this last little bucket in the back. How long does it take for hot water to get hot in your house? You know, it takes at least about two to three minutes, right? Well, where does all that water go? It just goes down the drain. And that's drinking water. That's not just washing water. That's drinking water that's going down the drain. So why not just collect it? Put a bucket under there, wait till it gets hot, take the bucket out, and what's right next to your shower usually? What's located right next to your shower usually? The toilet. Do you know you do not have to flush the toilet? All you have to do is pour water into it. It works just fine just by taking that bucket of water and flushing your toilet. Or you can water your plants. That's what my wife does. In fact, we have this ongoing war in our bathroom because she keeps her orchids in there and it's like, I want the water for the orchids, and I want it for the toilet. So ongoing sort of battle. But again, real simple thing. Simple thing when you're brushing your teeth or shaving, turn the water off. That's a huge one, Easy, easily done. In fact, if we look at just general usage in the home, you can see the shower takes up pretty much most of it in terms of domestic use. Laundry takes up the next, and the toilet is number three, right? So if you can shift these around a little bit, you can actually maybe change that budget a little bit. Washing machines, tremendous amount of water usage, as are dishwashers. Now again, dishwashers, you don't have to rinse the bit dish before it goes in the dishwasher. That's what the dishwasher's for, right? Don't need double water. For, for front-loading washers, these are the fluorescent light bulbs of washing machines, okay? They basically save 40 to 60 percent of your water budget for washing machines. And you can get more clothes in there too. Pretty impressive. As I mentioned, you know, you can, you can take this as far as you want. This was a sign that was up in St. Croix when I did my honeymoon, and I thought this was just incredible. I love this sign. Because, you know, all, basically you have people from the north that come down to the south and, you know, vacation and everything. So they put this sign up there to, because they're on an island, they had to conserve water. So they don't flush for number one. Okay? So a lot. Again, this kind of depends on how much, what your stamina is for, and how much airflow goes through your bathroom, right? Because that can get a little nasty. But. So uh, the other thing, I was doing really good on my budget thing till we got to the landscaping part. Oh my gosh. Grass. Unbelievable amounts of water for grass. And that has nothing, that touches nothing when you have a swimming pool. 
Swimming pool loses 1,000 gallons of water a year just in evaporation, 1,000 gallons. It's absolutely crazy. But, you know, recreation. So, you know, we're taking this to heart. So our, my goal is as soon as my kids finish high school, we're moving to the ocean. So I don't have a swimming pool. I have the ocean. I can go swim in the ocean. What a concept. And I won't have a yard either. That's the other thing. So, but thinking about this, you know, in terms of there are alternatives, drought tolerant plants. If you go to Las Vegas, nobody has a lawn in Vegas. Look, only the golf courses, which is stupid, but anyway. Um, the other thing to consider, food. You know, I love steak. I love it. I, you know, love it. But it, one 16-ounce steak costs 1,800 gallons of water. 1,800. That's what it costs to grow that cow up. And you're not even talking about the cost in terms of butchering and, and transportation to your local supermarket or restaurant or whatever. I mean, there are also health issues related to red meat consumption, but if anything, you know, there's also water issues related to that. In fact, if we look at a number of different crops and foods, there's some really expensive ones out there, rice particularly. And whoever decided to grow rice in the Central Valley of California should be shot. I, what, a, what a dumb idea, you know? I mean, the water requirements for that is absolutely astounding. Okay, but for some reason we decided to grow rice there. Coffee is another biggie. In fact, this is just the amount of water that's required to grow coffee. Do you know what most, it's been estimated a third of domestic water use for food in the house is for coffee? And how much of that gets poured down the sink because you don't, you make up more than just a cup, right? Typically you make a pot of coffee, right? Maybe you drink one, two cups. You've got the rest of that. Where's it go? down the sink. So that's a big waste. So, you know, go to Starbucks. <laughs> no, I'm not. I hate, I hate coffee, actually, but anyway. So take-home message. What's the take-home message? Not a lot of water out there, right? Groundwater, predominant water supply, but in areas that's being overdrafted, particularly in global areas, we got serious problems, and it's non-renewable. California, we've got this imbalance of where our water is and where the population lies, so we've got to move it. Okay? But the problem with that is it costs energy to do that. And I didn't even mention this. What hap what hap where do you think we get our energy from? And what happens with energy? We change the climate. So again, it's a vicious cycle that kind of comes in to play there. So what are the solutions? Probably the best thing is, is that of groundwater recharge. And we are doing this. And I think this, you'll see more and more of this in other areas that are water stressed. Um, the basic take home message is drink the water. If you're in Orange County, drink the water. The water's safe. It's totally safe. I mean, I mean, I make fun of it, but I drink the water there all the time. Okay? It's totally fine. With desal, costs are coming down, but it's way cheaper than the alternative of movement of aqueduct. And think about what happens if we have one big earthquake. What's going to happen to those, those levees and aqueducts in that particular case, right? So we're just one major earthquake away from, from a disaster for our state. But what can you do? Well, I would definitely do your water budget. See, where you, see what you can change. What are the things that you take advantage of? What are the things that you don't? One thing you know, is brought up is you can collect rainwater off your roof. But you know, Southern California doesn't rain that much. So to go through that whole infrastructure of building a, you know, a gutter supply thing, I don't know if that's the best thing you know, in terms of time limitation. You've got time limits. You know, focus on the things that you can do, that you can remember to do. That's a hard thing. Clothes, dishwashing, foods. Think about the foods that you're eating. Gardening. You know, if you want to garden, use a drip system. Okay? Maybe some drought-tolerant plants. And the thing all of us should be doing is checking for leaky faucets. It's amazing how much water is lost in a leaky faucet. Very simple to fix. Actually, you can do it online now. I've even done it. And I'm a nerdy scientist. so. So those are the things that you can do. So again, if we go back to the beginning, where does water come from? Well, it's a global cycle, right? It's a global cycle. Cycle infers going from beginning to end, right? So where does it come from? It actually comes from you, right? It ultimately comes from you. So take care of it, all right? OK. Any questions? So how much more does it cost per gallon to desalinate water than to use groundwater? 
how much more? If you go back to that, that slide, it actually has the numbers on there. So you can see in 2010, it was what, about $4 per gallon, per thousand gallons in Southern California versus fresh, which is gonna be groundwater. So that's about $3 per gallon. So it's about a dollar more from ground, compared to groundwater. On a global scale, which would, you, which would you say is more serious, the energy or the water crisis? Ooh, that's a good one. They're kind of intertwined, actually, I think. I think you have, um, again, primarily in, in countries that transport their water like we do, it's a tremendous energy resource or uh, demand. And again, the more energy do you demand, the, the more difficult that becomes in terms of climate change. Well, yeah, it seems very interesting that in the Middle East where they have lots of oil, they also seem to be lacking water. Exactly, and they're using fossil fuels to drive that desal component. So in that mm -hmm. particular case, you have a high energy input for drinking water for that particular region. What, what has been proposed, particularly in Africa, is actually to have people have their own uh, filtration systems or water systems themselves, either building cisterns or having some form of uh, a groundwater capture system that's local that people can then monitor and keep uh, themselves. It actually, it, it kind of goes to the astronaut uh, situation I discussed earlier is the closer that you can get to treating your own water, the less energy you're going to require to move that water away and then bring it back. Well, so yeah. I, I believe that they're trying to use solar stills as a big thing because that's right. it's low, for, uh, low technology and it's easily done. Yeah, for, for treatment of mostly the biological mm -hmm. aspects, yeah. All right, so how it says 97.5% of the water is salt water. With desalinization, would we be able to utilize that water? Yeah, that's the whole goal. That's the, that's the whole purpose. If you have this huge source of water that's present out there, it's just a matter of, of changing it so that we can actually get past that, that salty taste thing that drives us away. So the whole purpose is, yeah, you've got this endless, essentially endless supply of water that, that's sitting right outside you know, our coast here. Um, so you said that the water that we use here in Southern California is like pumped up over the grapevine. How does that process work, like logistically? Logistically, yeah. it's just a lot of energy. So, so first of all, you have to make the infrastructure for that. I don't know if you guys ever remember, in, in your lifetime, there probably hasn't been any infrastructure in the state of California, but um, the, the concrete, it was basically a concrete line channel that was created, so you have to have that conduit. And then you have to have a pump, right? You have to have multiple pumps, but, uh, and also there's, there's multiple storage uh, I think there's 10 reservoirs on the way down that, that's, that it kicks the water out to as it's moving. So you have to basically dig those out, right, construct those. You've got to have pumps that actually pump the water from the Delta or the, uh, the um, Colorado River. So there's a pumping component that's energy dependent, right? Um, fortunately, a lot of it, you know, they try to engineer gravity so that there's gravity flow. So you try to reduce energy that way. But when you get to the mountains, right, and you've, I'm sure you've seen these, you're right next to I-5, there are these little zigzag uh, tubes that go up into the, into the grapevine there. And uh, that's, you know, pumps that are based at, those, at the top of the mountain that are sucking that water up, up to the top, and then it's gravity fed back down into, into the LA Basin. So, it's a tremendous amount of energy. Does desalination, uh pose an environmental threat from taking the salt Ooh. out of the water, like especially when you're pulling, you're pulling salt water out of the ocean. And I know there's a, a threat with global warming where the, the caps are melting and the fresh water is desalinating the salt water. Mm -hmm. When you desalinate it, does it pose an environmental threat to saltwater species? So th there's, two, there's two points to that. So um, for one, the biggest question with, re with regard to impact of desal is actually not there's two things. One is pulling the water up out of the ocean. What do you pull with it? And this is, uh, power plants have been struggling with this for years. It's called entrainment, right? You pull up all these fish, larvae, particularly near shore, it's where most of your uh, reproduction takes place. So you're pulling up critical life forms of, of animals basically into that. We start thinking about how harmful algal blooms that take place. What happens if we have a red tide? Right? Do you take that water? You're pulling that water in for drinking water. You know, those are issues that that have been discussed, and they're actually 
in the last year, there's a, another panel that's just met, uh, the report's due out, I think, next week that looked at not only entrainment side, but then the big question is, what do you do with the brine? What do you do with that filtrate, right? So you've created all this clean water, now you've got all this junk that's left behind, right? Very concentrated junk. And if that happens to be uh, ocean, the ocean, it's primarily salts, right? So what do you do with that, that glut of salts? And right now, the biggest, the, the, the main thing is, at least people in Australia and California have been doing, is trying to blend that with wastewater. So you blend it to tr dilute it with wastewater, and then you shoot it out into, back into the ocean again. So that's one way. The other issue related to groundwater recharge, which is also a filtration process, is now you have all those drugs and pharmaceutical agents, right? And what happens, I told you they're eight nanograms per liter, but that's in surface water. What happens when you filter something, right? You pull all of those solutes out of that water, so now you've got a fairly concentrated solution that may actually have a higher dose. And that may be something, particularly if you're gonna take that and discharge that out into a water body, now you've completely changed the dynamic. You've made something that has a low concentration into something with a high concentration, and now you may actually have some, some risks associated with uh, health or, or wildlife issues. So those are the two main things, at least for desal in terms of environmental impacts, um, is an entrainment issue, and that's, again, more of a physical aspect. And then the chemical aspect is more, what do you do with the brine after you have it? And again, many things have been discussed, incineration, but right now, what it's, most people are doing, they're just packaging it with, with wastewater and sending it back out into the ocean. A lot of, lot of controversy about that, as you imagine.